Hello friends. Today, I want to talk to you about a very important aspect, as it affects the safety of electrical installations and the people who use them. We are going to see how to verify and measure the resistance of the grounding rods and electrodes. My name is Robert, and I hope this video is of interest to you, in that case don't forget to drop a like, subscribe to this channel and activate the notification bell. But before going into the details of the measurement, let's see what our grounding system is. For that, let us remember that we can design electrical installations with different diagrams, in terms of how to establish the protection against indirect contacts. In this way we can speak of DN, IT, or DD installations. If you have not seen my video on this topic, I recommend that you watch it, I leave the link to it at the top. If we take the TT diagram as an example, we will see that the masses or metallic elements of the loads in an installation must be electrically connected to a local grounding electrode, different from that of the electric company's transformer. The grounding system would be formed precisely by the direct electrical union, without fuses, or any protection that could interrupt it, and with low resistance between the metallic masses of the loads connected to the network, or of other conductive elements that do not belong to the electrical installation, and the physical ground, by means of an electrode, or groups of electrodes buried in the ground. The grounding system has several important objectives, for example, it allows to avoid dangerous voltage differences between conductive elements that we can touch simultaneously. It facilitates the passage to ground of fault currents, or discharge currents of atmospheric origin. It limits the voltage that the metallic masses may present at any given time with respect to ground, and also ensures the correct performance of the protections to eliminate or reduce the risk of a breakdown in the electrical materials used. The grounding system can be divided into two parts. On the one hand, the grounding itself with the electrode or group of electrodes, buried in the ground together with the bonding line and the grounding bar, where we can disconnect the bonding line for maintenance work. On the other hand, we have the ground installation, which consists of a main ground line with a ground bar, from which secondary ground lines can link other bars with the protection conductors that connect the metal masses of the equipment. This division tries to reflect the fact that, on the one hand, we will have to carry out continuity tests of all the cables of the grounding installation. And on the other hand, we will have to carry out measurements of the grounding resistance of the electrode or group of electrodes buried in the ground. In this video we are going to focus precisely on this second process, in the measurement of the resistance of the earth electrodes. Ideally, the grounding resistance would be zero ohms, but given the technical and economic constraints, on many occasions we must settle for a compromise value. Different international and local organizations or standards in each country establish recommended values. For example, the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers and the National Fire Protection Association of the United States, recommend a grounding resistance of 5 ohms or less. The National Electrical Code also in the United States recommends that the grounding system have a resistance of less than 25 ohms, and that in installations with sensitive equipment it is less than 5 ohms. For telecommunications systems, a maximum resistance value of 10 ohms is often considered. On the other hand, considering that the voltage to which a piece of equipment is going to be subjected, can be calculated as the ground fault current multiplied by the grounding resistance, if we consider that in many homes and public facilities there are residual current devices of 30 milliamps, so if we want to avoid having voltages higher than 50 volts in normal installations, and 24 volts in wet installations, we must ensure that the resistance that the grounding system can have is at most 1,666 ohms, and 800 ohms respectively. Taking into account these required grounding values, and depending on the characteristics of the soil, especially its resistivity, it will be necessary to design a system of grounding electrodes that can be formed by a single electrode, or by several ones, forming a kind of ring. Other times, it can be composed of a horizontal mesh buried in the ground, etc. As we can see, we can talk about the measurement of the grounding resistance of each individual electrode, or the set of electrodes. Once this introduction is made, we can go on to see the three main procedures for measuring the resistance of an electrode buried in the ground. These are, the method of the fall of potential, the selective method, and finally the method without stakes. For simplicity, we are going to consider that our grounding installation consists of a single electrode. As we can see in this example, the metal casing or ground of the washing machine and other metal elements such as metal pipes, must be electrically connected to the grounding rod. The first method that we are going to see to measure the grounding resistance, is the traditional method called fall of potential. This method is described in many standards of different countries as well as in international standards such as IEEE 81, entitled Guide for Measuring Earth Resistivity, Ground Impedance, 
and Earth's surface potentials of a grounding system. To use this method, it is necessary to disconnect the electrode under test from the rest of the installation. If the installation is in operation and has a single grounding electrode, disconnecting this electrode may pose a risk to the installation and to people. To avoid this situation, the so-called selective method that we will see later is available. Once the electrode has been disconnected from the installation, we will have to use an instrument called a tilurometer, which will be in charge of measuring the grounding resistance of the electrode. If you are an electrical installer, you may already have the Fluke 1664 FC multifunction tester, that is used to make electrical tests of continuity, residual current devices, etc., but it also includes a tellurometer. This instrument will allow you to perform this test. If you are going to carry out frequent grounding measurements, you may want to use a specialized tellurometer such as the Fluke 1623 or 1625, which are available with a very complete accessory kit including current clamps and longer cable reels, which are very comfortable to use. These two tellurometers allow us to use the three methods that we are going to see in this video. To carry out this measurement we must use two auxiliary stakes, of about 30 cm, that we have to insert into the ground at a distance of about 20 and 40 meters from the electrode under test. The tellurometer is going to inject an alternating current into the ground using the furthest auxiliary stake. This current circulates through the earth and returns to the equipment through the electrode under test. We can represent this idea considering that the tellurometer has a current source internally, which causes voltage drops to occur around the electrode under test, and the furthest auxiliary stake, creating a kind of sphere of influence. Now with the other auxiliary stake, what we are going to do is measure the voltage that appears on the electrode under test, with respect to the ground reference. We can imagine this situation considering that the tellurometer has a voltmeter internally which makes it possible to measure the voltage that appears on the electrode as a consequence of the applied current. In this way, we have the current that flows through the electrode under test, and we also know the voltage to which it is subjected, so we can apply Ohm's law. We can obtain the grounding resistance dividing the measured voltage by the current value injected into the ground. It is important to note that the auxiliary stake in the intermediate position, the one used to measure the voltage, must be outside the two spheres of influence at the ends so that it is precisely at the zero volt reference voltage of the earth. Hence the importance of separating the three stakes a sufficient distance of about 20 meters or more. To be sure that we are out of these spheres of influence, what we can do is take two additional measurements. A first measurement bringing the intermediate auxiliary stake one meter closer to the electrode under test. And then, a second measure moving at another meter away in the opposite direction. In this way we can compare the measurements, and see if they change. If the result changes substantially, then we will have to further separate the stakes from each other. If the result does not change, or changes very little, then as shown in the resistance variation graph, we will be in the area where the ground is actually at zero potential, and thus we will have obtained the correct value of the grounding resistance of the electrode under study. In this case using the fall of potential method. But before looking at the next method, let's see why it is necessary to disconnect the electrode under study from the grounding system. Suppose we forget to disconnect the electrode. As we can see now, the current injected into the ground through the furthest auxiliary stake can return to the equipment through the ground in two different ways. The first is the one already seen through the electrode under test. But now we can have returns by other ways, such as the metallic pipe that we can see in the image. This means that not all of the injected current flows through the electrode under test. In this way we see that if we do not disconnect the grounding electrode from the system, we are not really using the correct value of the current flowing through the electrode, and therefore the resistance value obtained will not be correct. In reality, we would be measuring a resistance that would encompass other elements that may be out of our control, so this measurement does not give us a certainty that the installation will have a good grounding in the future. However, checking and verifying the individual stakes of the installation, or a specific grounding mesh, does allow determining their situation and whether any maintenance work needs to be carried out. To avoid having to disconnect the electrode under test from the installation, the selective method is available. This method requires connecting a clamp meter to the tellurometer, and thus we can measure the current flowing through each electrode. As we have already seen, the instrument will inject a certain current into the ground. Part of it will return through the electrode under study, and another part of the current will flow through other electrodes and grounding elements. In this way, the current that circulates through the electrode under study may now be different from that injected but since we are measuring it with the clamp, 
the instrument will be able to use this measured value of the current in order to apply Ohm's law, and it will provide us with the correct value of the grounding resistance of that specific electrode, without having to disconnect it. Definitely, this test is much safer for the correct operation of the installation. For typical applications in buildings, transformation centers and substations, the clamps used are of a reasonable size to embrace the termination of the rod or its cable. However, there are other applications such as the verification of the grounding of high-voltage towers, where it is possible to use larger systems, which can embrace each leg of the tower to determine its correct grounding. In the event that due to soil characteristics, it is necessary to separate the auxiliary rods a considerable distance, the resistance of the measurement cables used should be taken into account, so that the instrument is capable of eliminating this resistance, using a process that measures this cable resistance and subtracts it from the final value. This process is often referred to as zeroing. Additionally, depending on the telerometer used, it is possible to connect a second cable to the instrument for voltage measurement, so in this case we speak of making a four-wire measurement. This procedure directly removes the resistance from the cable used for voltage measurement, which is important, as we have said, if the stakes have to be installed at a great distance. The zeroing process and the four-wire measurement are applicable to both the traditional fall of potential method and the selective method using the clamp meter. Finally, we can talk about the method called without stakes. This method does not actually measure ground resistance directly, but rather measures ground loop resistance. The stakeless method uses two clamps, one of which is a special voltage inducing clamp, it is a transformer that creates an electromotive force in the clamp wire, while the other is a clamp for current measurement. Physically we can find two types of instruments. On the one hand we have the solution based on a telerometer to which these two separate clamps can be attached and on the other hand we can find instruments with a clamp format that combine the induction clamp and the measuring clamp in a single element. This is the case with the Fluke 1630 clamp. To apply this method, it is required to have some kind of loop in the circuit where we place the clamps. If we embrace, for example, the grounding cable of a lightning rod, with an independent installation from the rest of the ground installation, that is, we have an electrode with a single cable that starts from it, and goes directly to the lightning rod without any other connection, it will be difficult for the voltage inductor clamp to circulate a current through the circuit, since it is open. In this case, applying Ohm's law, if we divide the voltage that the clamp generates and induces, by the current that circulates through the circuit, which is zero since the circuit is open, then we will have an infinite loop resistance. That is, the telerometer of the loop clamp will show us the highest value it can show. If, on the other hand, the clamp is applied in a system with several stakes in parallel, and we embrace the cable that comes out of one of them before joining with the rest of the stakes, in this case we will have a ground loop, or even several ones. In this way we can obtain an equivalent circuit where each electrode is represented by its grounding resistance, all of them in parallel, since at one end they are all connected by the ground cable, and on the other side they are connected through the ground. We also know that when putting resistors in parallel, the equivalent resistance decreases, so the more electrodes we have in parallel, the smaller that value of the equivalent resistance of the set formed by the rest of the electrodes will be. In this way, we will have a circuit, or loop, formed by the grounding resistance of the electrode that we have clamped, in series with the equivalent resistance of the rest of the electrodes. The loop resistance, which is the value that we actually measure, will be equal to the grounding resistance of the measured electrode, plus the equivalent resistance of the rest of the stakes, and if there are several rods in parallel, their equivalent resistance will be. As we can see, this method measures loop impedance, it does not directly measure the grounding resistance of the electrode, but the more stakes there are in parallel, the more the measured value will be similar to the grounding resistance of the electrode. If, for example, we have only two grounding rods, each one with a grounding resistance value of 5 ohms, and we place the clamps as shown in the figure on the left, then the measured value, that is the ground loop impedance, will be 10 ohms in this case. If we have three rods in parallel, the measured value will be 7.5. If we have 4 rods in parallel, then the measured value will be 6.7 ohms and if we have 5 electrodes in parallel the measured value will be 6.25 ohms. As we see the more electrodes there are in parallel with the one we are measuring, the more the value of the loop impedance is similar to the value of the grounding impedance of the electrode we are measuring. We must also be careful with the place where we clamp the instrument, since although the installation may have several stakes in parallel, if we do it as shown in the image, that is, in the output cable of the set of stakes, in this case we would not have a ground loop on the line where we have placed the clamp, and therefore, 
the value that we are going to measure is infinite, but since infinity is difficult to show on the instrument display, we will surely obtain the highest value that the instrument can display. To finish, just remember that the value of the grounding resistance can vary over time for different reasons, for example in summer, when the ground is drier, the grounding resistance tends to increase. Similarly, a very low ground temperature can increase the grounding resistance, or even due to the composition of the ground itself, oxidation and deterioration of the electrode can occur, and thus increase the grounding resistance. For this reason, it is highly recommended or even mandatory depending on the countries and the type of installation, periodically check the status and resistance of the grounding electrodes. And so, we have reached the end of this presentation that I hope you have found interesting. If that is the case, don't forget to drop a like, so that I know that you liked it. In future videos I will discuss more issues related to electrical installations, therefore, if you don't want to miss them, don't forget to subscribe to this channel and activate the notification bell. See you in the next video. Bye.